Here we go. So we're going to start with a couple of environment diagram examples. And I will share my screen. I think it's important to understand how nested lists work and kind of look at the most common methods for mutating lists and also um, for accessing the elements of a list. I know this wasn't really in today's lecture. It was part of a review problem that I put at the end of the lecture, uh, but someone requested it last time. So I figured I'd just put it in here. Um, and then if anyone has questions about other stuff, uh, we can certainly jump into that. So um, let's see what this example does. Well, we should try to anticipate what's going to happen. When you create a list with lists in it, this will be a two element list. So uh, uh, two boxes, each of which has a list as the contents. So here's how you draw that. Um, this list here, which is called T, represents the list created by the outermost square brackets. But the contents of that list is a list and another list. And we draw these lists as separate boxes, one of which has one element, one of which has two. OK, so what does it mean to extend? Extend means take all the elements in T, of which there are two, this one and this one, and put all of those at the end of T. So T, which is a list containing two elements, will now contain four elements. This will still be element 0. This will be element 1. But this will be element 2, and this will be element 3. Looks like that. Now, an important thing is that we didn't duplicate this list. We created it once here, placing square brackets. It's called a list literal, and that's how you create a new list. So we created one new list, two lists, three lists, but we never created any new lists with t extend t. So we still have only three lists. It's just that t now has four elements in it instead of two. The zeroth and first element are what they were before. The element number two is the same as element zero because we took these two elements and put them in the end. What does it mean to put them at the end? Well, it means draw two new boxes and draw arrows to the elements of the list. OK. Let's see what this says. This says change T1. What is T1? Go to T. It's this list. We go to T1. It's this list. So this is the list we're changing. I hope you can see my mouse. OK, T1.append T0. So we're going to add one element to the end of this. That's what append always does. We're going to add whatever T0 is. And T is this. 0 is that, which means we're going to add one more box to the end of here, extending it to three elements. And this will contain an arrow to that list. Now, Python Tutor moves it over so that all the arrows move to the right. Uh, but it's still the same list here. And we've just added a third reference to it. So I can refer to it as T0 or T2 or T1, 2. Or actually, I can refer to it as T3, 2 as well. Well, and this example just keeps going. What does it mean to append to T? Well, that means add one element to the end of T. So T has one, two, three, four elements already. We would add a fifth. And what are we going to append? Well, whatever T1, 2 is. Oh, T1, 2 is the thing at the end of this arrow is this list. So we're appending this list. That means we're adding yet another arrow to that list. This is the new one. It is now element at index 4 of t, as well as being element at index 0 and element at index 2. So what happens if you print t? Well, you're printing a list with five elements. So we'll get square bracket and four commas and then an end square bracket. The first thing will look like this. The second thing will look like 2, comma 3, comma bracket 1, close bracket. And then this will look like bracket one bracket. This will look the same as element at index two. And this will look the same as element at index zero. So that's what it looks like. There's that list. 
There's that list. And then they just repeat. Okay, that's the end of this example that kind of illustrates how to look things up, how to append, and how to extend, and how to build lists in the first place. Phew. Okay, I'm gonna dive into the second one. Here's my second example, a little bit less involved, but it involves a slice, which is why I picked it, and it involves a pop. Those are both common as well. So we start out the same way, a list with two elements. Those are both lists, but both of those lists just contain numbers. What does it mean to append a T? Well, that means adding another element to the end of T, which is this list. But what are we going to add? Well, in this case, we're going to add T sliced from one to two. What slicing always does is create a new list. So we're gonna add a fourth list to this picture. It's going to have an arrow to it from element indexed two of T. And what is its contents? What's contents is everything that's contained within T from element one through element two, including one, but not including two. Well, it's good we're not including two because there is no element two. So that means this slice is going to create a list with just this element in it. And what is this element? We follow the arrow and we see that it's this list two, three. So we're appending a new list with one element, and that element is the list two, three. Here's what it looks like. We've added a fourth list. This fourth list, called T2, has one element, and that one element is the same as the element of T, which we sliced. So it would be a mistake to just draw an arrow from here to here, because you would have missed the list within a list structure, which is what's really going on. Okay, what does it mean to T1.pop? Well, we have to figure out what we're popping from. If we look at T, element at index one, it's this list that we're popping from. Popping means remove the last element and return it. We're not doing anything with the return value, so it's just kind of being lost, but this element will disappear. Since it disappears from element at index one, it's also disappearing from the contents of element at index two. So if we print this out, we're going to see a list with three elements. The first one is a list containing one, the second is a list containing two, and the third is a list containing a list containing two. Looks like that. Okay, I think the question is, why is this here and what does it mean? Is that right? Yeah. yeah. This is here because uh, what we've built is not just a list within a list, but a list within a list within a list. Now, why is that useful? Well, I mean, there are cases in which you want this kind of nested structure, but I think we can decompose this a little bit and understand why it's different from this case. So this case is just a list containing two is an element. And this has this one extra level of indirection. If I take T2, which is that list that has a list in it, and I append to that, say the number four, I'll get the following structure. Here's where we were. This is going to appear as another element in this list. So this thing that we've created could have more stuff in it later than it has now. At the moment, it only has one thing in it. And lists with one thing in it are kind of, are kind of not so helpful, right? I mean, why have a list with something in it when you could just have that thing? Like, why have this list containing one? Well, the answer is that you might want to put more things in there later. Throughout the course of computation, if you're trying to track, you know, accumulate some values in particular places, then you might start out with a list that has only one thing in it, but you might want to append to it later. So that's basically why uh, this is different than that. If we now print this out, we'll see that appending four here didn't affect element at index one, but it did affect element at index two. Now the element at index two is a list that does contain this list of two, but also contains the number four. Uh, good questions. Let's take a look at this pop. 
I'm going to get rid of this four here and just focus on here. Um, we could have done this in two steps. We could have said y is t1 and then y dot pop. Whereas originally we had t1 dot pop, right? And um, maybe this will explain what's going on. Yeah, so basically we referred to this thing and we popped from that. You are totally right that if instead we had popped from t, it would have just got rid of the whole thing. Let me just get organized for two seconds and then we can investigate. Mm. Oh, that should do the check. That doesn't do the check because I forgot to make a default value. I thought this like displayed it nicely. Hold on, hold on. Oh, I don't draw. Oh, very nice. Okay, so this will draw trees for us, which I think might be helpful. So, uh, and let me just quickly fix this definition. We don't go crazy. All right, so the question was, um, can we kind of talk about the recursive leap of faith related to tree processing and um, kind of how do you know how to use this concept in order to get things done. So the recursive leap of faith itself is that when you're defining a function, you assume that that function's already been de defined for you and that it works. What does it mean it works? It means it does the thing that you're intending your function to do. So if you're writing a function that counts up the number of leaves, you assume you have a function that counts up the number of leaves of some smaller tree and that it works. So if you call it, you'll get back the number of leaves in some smaller tree. And this is useful for tree processing because the branches of a tree are always trees themselves. So if you've got some tree, uh, make one up. This one's got a two, and this one's got a one and a three. All right, for the slowness, but that's how it goes. Okay, I made two branches, I made a tree. See what it looks like. Okay, good. So if I have this tree, I know that this part, which is rooted at two with one and three, is also a tree, and this part that's rooted at six is also a tree. So, um, those are things that I can make my recursive calls on. And the recursive leap of faith says, I should assume those calls do what they're supposed to do. So I don't know, if I wanted to sum up the elements, I would assume that I'd be able to sum up the elements or the labels using just one function call. And then I could sum up the labels here using a second function call and then I'd be done. How would I sum up all the labels? add in keys label, that's the number four, but then I wanna add up uh, all of the labels in here so that I can do with a recursive call on the branch, where this is a branch B. If I write the list comprehension, some labels B for B in T dot branches. What this will do is call this B, and then call some labels on it, which gives me the sum, two plus one plus three is six. And uh, then later call this B and give me the sum, which is six plus seven is 13. So uh, it should be that six plus 13 is 19 and four is 23. What happens if I actually try this? I got 23. So that's kind of a simple example, but one that does sort of trust that some labels is gonna do what it's supposed to do, which is sum up all the labels of the branch. And then you think, oh, once I have the number six and once I have the number 13, 
and I have the number four, how do I put them all together to get the sum of all of the three? And the answer is that you add. And the question is about pre-order traversal, which was on one of the labs, and how you get a pre-order traversal. Well, um, I, it depends exactly what you want to do. But let's say you want to build a list with all of these labels in it. So you're going to build a list of numbers. And you want them in a particular order. Um, the order that's called the pre-order traversal has the root at the top and then a pre-order traversal of the first branch and then a pre-order traversal of the second branch. So you'd write the number four and then the number two and then the number one and then the number three, kind of done with this now, then the number six and then the number seven. Okay, so um, again, we're gonna make a recursive leap of faith. We're going to assume that if we call pre-order on this branch, we will get two, then one, then three. And if we call pre-order on this branch, then we'll get six and seven. So to build the result, I want a list of numbers. I know I want the first number to be four. But that's a reasonable place to start. And then I want to call pre-order on a branch. And in fact, I want to do this for all the branches in t.branches. Like, let's talk about the first one. So B is going to be bound to this branch 2, 1, 3. When I call pre-order on it, what I get back is the list 2, 1, 3. That's my recursive leap of faith. What do I do with the 2, 1, 3 is at the beginning, I had a list. Oops. Ah, oh, what have I done? That looks so nice. Okay, pre-order on B gives me two, one, three. I had a list called result with four in it. I want to put two and one and three after the four. Which I can do with result.extend the numbers two, one, and three. The next L iteration through the for loop, B will be bound to the tree 6, 7. Calling pre order on 6, 7 will give me the list 6, then 7, which I put at the end of the result list. And now I can get a pre order type today for T, and it will give me 4, 2, 1, 3, 6, 7. So there's the pre order for the first branch, there's the pre order for the second branch. And the reason I used extend was to get them all in one long list. If I wanted, uh, let's say, a post order. Mm -hmm. So we kind of want to go through the branches backwards, it seems. Or be in reversed t dot branches. And now b is going to be bound to this tree with 6 and 7 in it. Yeah, I kind of screwed up, didn't I? Let's try it again. We want a list. Let's start it out empty. And then for B in reverse T dot branches, we need to get a seven and a six in there. Uh, you could, but instead you could trust your recursion. Call post order on B. So what that is going to do is take this whole tree, six followed by seven, and turn it into the list seven, six. And then I'll call post order on this B, which will take this whole tree and turn it into three, one, two. So now I have seven, six, three, one, two. I got to get that four in there somehow. There it is. I turn the result. Now the post order for T is seven, six, three, one, two, four. Nicely done. Oh, I, I guess I should repeat the question for the recording. The question was, where did we get reversed? And I said, it's built in, uh, like map and filter. All right. Last call, any more questions?